everybody and welcome to episode 7 of the Great Fight North Boxing Podcast brought to you by Scrapyard Boxing Club in Peterborough, Ontario and Kerry Hendren, Remax All-Stars Realty Inc. Brokerage in Omimi. I'm Jason Tufexis and with me, I feel like I could see you almost as clearly as when we're in person, Ryan Scalia on his new laptop. What's up, buddy? Yeah, new laptop. It also means... Um... You get to see how pale I am in HD. Hey, I, I might have to put some kind of special filter in Premiere Pro, <laughs> some tan filter. I could use one too. Although uh, I've been getting out on the bicycle. I got a, a sweet bike um, for my uh, 40th B-Day last week. So I've been trying to get out. So you may see, hopefully, a more tanned and less white and pink uh, Jason Tufex as well. But uh, man, first off, let's just talk about what it feels like to be back here in fight time like we got to watch fights last saturday we got to see ufc we got to watch fights uh last night or, or two nights ago i guess uh, when was it thursday or wednesday i can't even remember now it was last night yeah saturday and wednesday okay yep yeah. and then another one tomorrow night how did that feel for you personally to get back into watching live fights again yeah i mean i haven't watched like a full ufc top to bottom oh uh desperate i am for live combat sports and honestly the, the shows turned out pretty good you know there's some some good fights and you know i was thoroughly entertained can't complain yeah and uh, actually a little later in the show because i want to get straight into the interviews i do want to talk a bit about uh the idea of throwing in the towel or or calling a fight early from the corner because i think we saw a couple of beatdowns in the last two ufc events that were like career altering but we'll get into all that stuff later on we got a couple of news and notes to go over uh but first off we got two great interviews this week for you let's get into both of those right here all right we are here with none other than two-time ibf junior featherweight world champion the canadian kid everyone's favorite guest steve molitor welcome back man to the great fight north boxing podcast video edition this time Hey, Jason, it's great to see you. Great to see Ryan. Um, it's tough being on this lockdown. I got the lockdown beer going on, but you guys look good. Oh, man, you're looking great, honestly. I know Scalia's been commenting on the beard look the whole time. Scalia's was much longer before mine, too. I decided to trim it because I wanted to let you have the shine tonight. You know what I mean? <laughs> and speaking of shine, I see some shiny trinkets behind you, man. Walk us through what's behind you right now. Um, those are just my two world titles and some collage and some pictures for my fights. But the first one I won in um, England in 2006, November 11th, first Michael Hunter. And then in 2010, March 27th, I beat Endeloff at Casino Rama for the second one. Amazing, man. Two-time champ. And we actually have a, a fan question for you about that after, but we'll, we'll get to it a little bit later on. Um, first off, man. Talk to us. How has quarantine been treating you, buddy? I mean, we asked this to everybody on the show right now because everybody's experience is different. How have you been holding up? I'm um, quarantined. Like, I, I, uh, I'm an uh, operations manager at Triple M Metal, a uh, scrap metal recycling company. We're um, deemed an essential service because, you know, I mean, um, recycling is part of everything, making stuff for the hospitals. So I've been working, so it's been keeping me sane. And, you know what I mean? Yep. So I kind of basically live my own life aside from. What I miss most, and it's and it's and it's hurting me. I I don't get to go to the gym. Yes, and that is something that obviously we're going to be talking about here because I mean, look, you're retired. Um, it's been several years now, but every time I see you, uh, every time Scalia sees you, you're in fighting shape. Like you, you do not balloon up in weight and you know get out of shape. It's just not you. So uh, talk to us about what you've been doing in that sense. Is you can't be in the gym. What are you doing to stay in shape besides just, you know, um, hanging out, working, and taking care of the kids? For this, um, 
even before this lockdown, like even before this lockdown, I always just kept running. Um, even when I work out and do weights, I always still run. So that's what I've just had kind of had to be my main source is running, but you know, sticking to my diet and, you know, trying to do my best just to, to stay in shape. Well, it looks like you're doing a good job, man. Like I said, you got uh, everything on point still. You got your hair on point. Um, <laughs> but uh, look, you know, everybody's kind of bored right now, as we know. And one thing I wanted to talk to you about, we were chatting earlier in the day, um, to just get your take on it, because I think you can provide a very unique perspective as a retired fighter. We see uh, a lot of retired fighters right now uh, feeling the quarantine, feeling the, 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 I guess, the need to be doing something. And guys like Mike Tyson, first of all, did you see that Mike Tyson video of him hitting the mitts and stuff the other day? Crazy. I love it. I seen him at Casino Rama in January do his yes. stand. And obviously he's a legend, but like, you know, he's, you know, he's got a little belly, like, you know, he's enjoying the retired life. Like he didn't look like he's in any sort of fighting shape. When I seen that video and the ferocity in his punches and, and, the, and the bad intentions, it's just like, holy fuck, the guy's a different dude. But I love it. I love Mike Tyson, fat and funny or, or slim and tough. I love him either way. Yeah, well, right now he's looking slim and tough. There is no question about that. And everybody is kind of going on this whole thing about, is Tyson coming back? I heard there's going to be Holyfield coming back. We saw James Tony put out a video saying he wants in. Um, what I kind of wanted to get from you is, is your thoughts first, is your thoughts on these kind of guys coming back once they've walked away and let's be real. They walked away for good. We're not talking about Jordan walking. I, I just watched the last dance, of course. So we're not talking about Michael Jordan walking away in 93 only to come back two years later. These are guys <clears throat> yourself who have said, okay, I'm hanging up the gloves. My time in the ring is done. What do you think about this whole thing of these kind of guys saying, okay, you know what? Maybe I'm back. Maybe I'm going to come back, back and do one more fight. Um, Mike Tyson is the greatest heavyweight ever, one of the most exciting fighters ever. I love him and I have the utmost respect for Mike Tyson. <clears throat> He's very polite when I met him at Casino Rima backstage. Um, but like you said, it's not a two-year layoff. It's like a 12 or however 15-year or whatever year layoff. And he did retire at the end when he had lost his last fight to Kevin McBride, who in reality is a nobody in the heavyweight pitcher. And, you know, I mean, he went out – you know, against a bum. So to think he can come back at 53, yeah, he looks good on the pads. Anybody can look good on the pads, realistically. Mike Tyson is a killer, greatest heavyweight ever, but at 53, I don't think it's realistic if you were to fight somebody like Deontay Wilder or Tyson, uh, Tyson Fury. I just don't think it's realistic. No, no, I, 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 don't, I don't think so either. Like, obviously, you know, I've never really been in the ring, of course, but just as an observer, it doesn't seem like a, like a realistic thing. Let's take you as an example, a guy who stayed in shape. You're, you're still a young guy. I think we're the same age, right? I think we, you, you, you hit the big number just a, a week or two before me. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you still feel good. I'm sure you still wake up and feel pretty fit, minus all of the aches and pains from all of your years in the ring. But, I mean, <laughs> could you do it? Could you say tomorrow, you know what? I'm making another run at it. I'm going to get back into the gym. I'm going. Like, could you do it physically? I don't think I could do it physically, especially to the level that I was at. Could I do it to get in the ring? I'm sure I could get in the ring and, and you know what I mean, and get to a certain level. Do I want it? Every day when I go for a run, I'm like, you know what? Fuck, dude. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? did it for such a long time. I think you get back in shape and, you know, bang off an eight-rounder. But realistically, even in my last fight when I fought um, Carl Frank, I was still in pretty good shape, and I hadn't had too many miles on my at, at that point. Like I never took any serious beatings. But even at that point, I was just a step below the top level. So to come back and to have a six- or eight-round fight, I mean, it doesn't interest me at all. So have you ever thought about, like, if you were around today, you would have made, like, so much more money, you know, in this era? Absolutely. You know, you know, with guys like PBC and Al Heyman and just, yeah, the money's just gone up incredibly and, and things are a lot different, but you know I mean, I, I, <clears throat> I'm grateful for what Alan Trombley and Casino Rama did for me. Um, like I've said before to the media, when me and Alan Trombley had a little rift, Don King called me personally and said, Stevie, you know, come down to Florida. And then I told him what I was getting, he goes, honestly, a hundred grand for a voluntary defense, U S dollars. I don't even think I could give you that. I talked 
Aaron Hussein, Israel Vasque, and Oscar Larios at that time who were having a trilogy fight with the second fight mm -hmm. around the same amount of money. So, I mean, I feel as, you know, considering it was 10 years ago, I made pretty good money for a, a white boy, 122 pound Canadian. For sure. <laughs> yeah. And so you're the last world champion from Ontario, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. That's crazy. But you know what? There's a lot, there's a lot of guys, <clears throat> Brandon Cook. Um, I'm a big, big fan of, um, what's the kid? Lucas Bahati. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that kid's going to be a fucking machine in the sport. I think, you know I mean? I just, I think he's really good. Um, you got the Southpaw, um, Josh O'Reilly from Hamilton, the Wilcox boys, Brandon Cook who has fought for a world title on short notice with an injury. I think there's just so much talent in the province and I'm waiting for someone to become the next world champion and surpass me. Do you think, do you think that'll be bittersweet in any way or will it feel like you're passing on the torch? Like without you, it wouldn't be the same. Absolutely. I, I'm not going to be happy. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping for. And I, you know, I talk to these guys once in a while on social media and I try to give them my advice and my encouragement because I want greatness for the province. When I became the first world champion after so many years, I wanted to open the floodgates for these other young fighters to be like, Hey, you know what? It is possible. Yeah. We're from Ontario. We're from Canada, but it, it's doable. I can, you know what I mean? I felt that I got to do that. It made me happy. And I want to see these other guys do that. I want to see Brandon Cook, Josh O'Reilly, the Wilcox brothers, Lucas Pot. I want to see them all get world titles. All yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah. No, us too. And you know, we were supposed to be calling this past Saturday, you and I. Of course, uh, for those who don't know, Steve and I are broadcast partners for uh, the United Boxing Promotion shows out in Brampton. We were supposed to be calling a big show uh, this past Saturday. Uh, my birthday would have been a great way to, to celebrate, but didn't happen. But, you know, you've been there ringside watching these guys come up. And I see when they look at you watching them um, during it and listen to what you're saying versus what I'm saying is just some guy who's talking. It's a big difference. I mean, they look up to you as um, a trailblazer. Do you personally, though, feel like you don't get the credit that maybe you deserve as a Canadian two-time champion? Or do you feel um, pleased overall with how everything kind of shook out with your career over those years? Like I said, I'm just a white kid from Sarnia, Ontario. I'm grateful for everything that I get. I worked hard to get to where I got to, but I'm not looking for people to want to be around me or, or want my autograph or, or want to bow down to me. Like I'm just a regular dude like, you hang or Ryan when you hang in me. I mean, I'm just a normal guy. Like, I don't give a shit about people bowing down. Um, it's nice to be acknowledged for, for the efforts that I put in, but it don't matter to me either way. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I love it. I love it because you're a straight shooter. And I know that what you're saying right there is real. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that's fantastic, man. Now um, let's talk a little bit about the transition out of being a pro fighter, a high level pro fighter who had been at it for years, you had your ups and downs. I know we talked about it a little bit on the last time that you're on the podcast, but it wasn't a video one. We're going to have a different audience here. Um, what was that like for you going from being the Canadian kid to being Steve Molitor, if that makes sense. So the, that, that shift where you're no longer the guy that now you're a normal guy, a former fighter, everybody still loves to see you. Everybody wants to hear the stories, but knowing that you don't have that upcoming fight coming up, what was that like at the beginning? And how was that adjustment to your, your real life? I guess you could say. Um, it was a little tough. I'm not going to lie. Like, you know, I mean, when, when the media is waiting to see to, you know, you go to the gym and the media is there waiting at the door to take your pictures and shit like that. Or, you know, people are just, you're, you know, you're more active, you're more famous, you know, you go to the mall, you go here, you go there, you're more noticed. But again, I'm a private guy. I'm just a regular dude. I don't like attention. I don't really give a shit. It was tough. Um, you know, not to, to have that level or that, or that, that hunger to fight and to get into the ring. Like I miss that. I like get amped up and going through training camp and stuff like that. I miss the financial reward of it. Obviously I'm not going to lie. And I miss the competition the most. You know what I mean? As I watched that Michael Jordan documentary, I realized like, fuck, like I'm competitive too. Like I don't care if it's ping pong 
one of the things I actually do most, I have a ping pong trophy that I won at a Filipino community center. <laughs> I partied all night. I lost the first game, but it was a double loss of elimination. And I won the motherfucker. And there's guys there with headbands and like serious players. I showed up with fucking jeans, oh, lost the first game. I'm like, fuck, dude. And I came back and won because I'm very competitive. Clearly, clearly. So really, you should be a three-time champ. Forget about two-time champ. You got to do it. Can you give me that trophy? That, yeah, yeah, I want to see that. I want to see that. Um, dude, I think that, you know, in watching that Jordan documentary, I realized what uh, sets him apart uh, aside from insane natural talent. And that, that's actually a really interesting point. There are certain fighters that I see that are very, very talented and skilled. Some young guys, I won't say who right now, some guys in Canada. But I question if they have that competitive edge to be able to get them past the competition that's coming up next. Do you ever see that in fighters where you're like, this guy's got all the skills, but that competition mind that you and Jordan have isn't there. Is that something that's that you see and can a fighter learn that or is that innate? I think there can be guys who are, you know, regular world champions or just average and, and have that. But to be that, that superstar or that pound for pound king or the kid who won the first world title in however many years, you got to have that mentality of just like everything you want to do, you want to win. <clears throat> and it carries through even today, even my work life today, I'm super competitive. It gets me in trouble <laughs> a little bit. Like I just want to be the best always. I don't give a fuck what it is. Yep. Um, we're going to play, uh, what's that game maybe? Crow we're going to play Crow with my kids and I've told her and my mom like listen I'm gonna whip you guys and that's it <laughs> pretty bad yes nice dude amazing gateway for new Canadians and here's the Canadian kid taking their trophy away bro what the hell in jeans and my party <laughs> close from the night before <laughs> reeking of booze just fucking like all right let's go ah, I love it I love it <laughs> and guess who I beat listen to me I beat Chris Johnson in the final. Chris is good at ping pong. Don't get it twisted. Okay. We used to play with Adrian every day after we do our, our track and morning weights in the morning at the YMCA. We'd literally play for like two hours. We'd gamble like heavy money and Amazing. we'd play for like two hours. So and then you are home and nap and then box later. You are Jordan. I mean, this is basically like watching that documentary, Jordan betting on the coin flips and stuff with the guys at the, uh, at the arena. Ah, this is amazing. Okay, there we go. We think <laughs> amazing thing. <clears throat> yeah, so we talked about like the future of Ontario and maybe who could be kind of, I guess, your successor. Like, what's it gonna take, you know, to for some of these guys and girls to become world champions? Um it just takes it, it takes the will, it takes the heart. You mean you gotta believe in yourself, like people know like I didn't come off an extensive amateur career. Um, I was 122 pounds. I wasn't a very exciting fighter. Yeah, I was dominant and I won, I won clear. Um, so it was tough and there was a time where I didn't fight for 13 months. I couldn't you know, get a promoter, I couldn't be a regular fighter. But you just gotta have the will and the mentality to just be like, listen, and just go for it. And I know those guys, like I said, Lucas Pahati is a, <clears throat> a big favorite of mine. I see him right now in quarantine. Oh, negative falls. Being a soldier, just working out every day. I know the guys in Hamilton, the Wilcox brothers. I know Brandon Cook's a machine. All these guys in Ontario can do it. But it just takes the mentality to, to follow through and just, you know, you never give up. Now, you know, this actually leads into something I also wanted to talk to you about because I know it's something that's, close to your heart, you, you mentioned the mentality that it takes to be a winner. Um, but I know for you, uh, it's no secret. We talked about it on the last time you had your demons, you had your uh, substance abuse problems in the past that you somehow managed to overcome, not just overcome, but win another world title after that's a separate story we could go on. <clears throat> what kind of advice do you give to young fighters, these kinds of guys who are on the precipice of big things, guys like we talked about body, Brock Stumpf, uh, Cook, O'Reilly, all these kind of guys. Like there's more than just 
how you're hitting the pads and what you, you know, uh, uh, how, how many kilometers you could do on your road run. There's the whole lifestyle aspect. There's the drugs and alcohol aspect. There's the keeping your mind sharp and safe. What are some of the things that you talk to young fighters about in that sense? Um, it's tough, especially like when you get to a level or even just, you don't even got to get to a fucking level. Like regular household people just like to party and drink on the weekends and, <clears throat> and do coke and do blow and shit like that or, and then experiment with drugs. And in the end, ultimately, like for me, like in between fights, like after I used to get a lot of hand injuries, my hands would be fucked up. They used to give me Percocets as many as I wanted. <clears throat> and then I was like, okay, next fight. Both hands are sore and my eyes all fucked up. So then it became Oxycontin. And I became very, very dependent on those. And then um, I had a lot of people in the outside world that be like, hey, Molly, like, we love you. You okay? There's four of free drugs. And it just, I think it just cut my career short and it really slowed me down. Even though I never did it during training camp, I just think that ultimately, it's what shortened my career mm. and it's tough to battle that, but you know, I mean, guys who really want to get to that next level, that Floyd Mayweather level, <clears throat> um, like Lucas Bahati and even drinking and shit like that, like drinking's horrible for you. Like, um, just to, to stay focused. And that's one point of my career, which I wished I would have focused more on is not fucking around after fights for two weeks because, or a month, because those months ultimately cut my career short. I feel, mm. <clears throat> Amazing, man. So good advice. Um, let's go to a question from uh, Eric Belanger, one of our uh, one of our Twitter followers and fan of the show. He said, "Great uh, trainer out of Montreal." Oh, or okay, <laughs> different Eric Belanger. But this week, this past week, they actually interacted with each other, and my mind Isn't exploded. It? So this is a different Eric Belanger. I know I, I'm buddies with Eric, who has his gym out here in Ottawa, uh, Final Round Boxing. And trains Castile Clayton and uh, Pat Patrice Volney, who we had on the show earlier. But uh, this is a different Eric Belanger, but he's still a good guy. So let's go with it. Uh, he said, may you please ask Steve to bring us back to when he won his second title and the journey leading up to that fight. I read he overcame some personal demons after losing to Caballero and winning his IBF belt back must have been exhilarating. Not many can climb that mountain twice and just the last follow-up so we don't forget it. He inspired a lot of young fighters and made a lot of Canadian boxing fans believe that our country has its place with the boxing elite. I thank him for that. So really nice message from Eric. But talk to us about that period. Eric, Eric, thank you for the respect. Um, yeah. so you want me to talk about what led me back to especially like <clears throat> after all the shit I was doing in between fights. And let me, let, me, let me make one thing clear. Like I would fight, I'd get my money and I'd have a month off where I could just party and do drugs and shit like that. Um, but once I signed a contract for the second fight, I never ever did anything. Like once I, con the, I met with Alan Trombley and signed the contract, it was <laughs> clean and sober, diet, train twice a day. <clears throat> but in between that, but after I, I lost the Caballero and I, and I really fucking, my whole world came down. My wife was nine months pregnant. I had my first loss in the biggest stage possible. That could have, you know what I mean, shot me to the biggest stage ever if I would have beat Caballero, right? Like a, a unification for, for me could have been really big financially and for my, my career. Um, and I was doing a lot of drugs, but then, so that was in November 21st, 2008. Come here, Steel. But this is my son, Steel. Young champ. Hey, Steel. Hey, what's up? Hey, hey. Um, and he was born January 5th, 2008. Nine, what's up? 2009. <laughs> and, but just before that, I remember Alan Tremblay called my, my, my wife, my ex-wife, my wife at the time. He's like, how's Stevie doing? <clears throat> and I was in the other room. I can just remember her crying and just being like, he hasn't moved out of the couch in two weeks. And this is my, my wife was pregnant at nine months. And I'm thinking, listen, don't be a fucking bitch. Like, he lost your world title. You're going to be a father to a child. Like, he depends on you as a fucking man. 
Like, get your shit together and don't be a fucking bitch. And I remember because I lived in the penthouse of a condo, um, I didn't want to throw them in the garbage. I'm like, well, uh, if you kill them in the garbage, boy, you can go get those motherfuckers in like two days. So I went to the garbage chute of the penthouse and I just threw them down the chute. And that was it. Cold never, turkey like that. You never tried to dive in and, and get them back the next day or were you good? <laughs> no. okay. That's 31 floors, dude. <laughs> Might have been a little rough. Might have cut that eye open, right? But uh, okay. So, so, so once you were clean and sober, um, what did that feel like? That kind of victory, aside from winning that second title, obviously it's, it's a huge accomplishment that so few fighters can even claim to have done and accomplished. But there must have been a, a, a separate vindication where it's like, not only did you defeat him, you defeated your, your old self in a way. Did That's one of my biggest victories. Like when I don't really tell people because I wanted them to fucking like, oh, what do you mean you're big? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but for me, like that was the biggest thing, like, just to stop that cold turkey. <clears throat> It's not like I was doing like a little bit of oxy and coke. I was doing a lot of oxy and coke like every day. After I lost, like I went into like the worst depression ever. Like you were there, Jason. Run sure you knew about it. Like TSN magazine, MTV Cribs, two hundred thousand dollars to fight Caballero. My next fight could have been for like six hundred thousand, and who knows what could have happened after that. <clears throat> and not only did you get beat. But to get fucking crushed in four rounds yeah. um, was, it was hard for me. Like, it took me down. Can you talk a little bit about that experience of losing from being on the highest highs to kind of realizing? No pun intended. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Being on the highest highs to the lowest lows. But um, was that why you were really abusing substances? Or was it already kind of in the mix and you just took a dive? Like, what was the, the psychological feeling after you, you lost that? Were you, was it, how, how long did that last for until you were able to pick yourself up? Was this such, such, <clears throat> like I said, after I lost to Caballero, which I think was November 21st, 2009, my son was born January 5th, but from November 21st to like, December 15th, every day, 24 hours, nonstop, um, you know, peeling the coating off oxys and snorting them and just laying there. Jeez, man. Oof. So definitely a low and a low. Um, it, I mean, again, just incredible that you were, that you were able to turn that around and become a champ. And nothing in over 11 years now, nothing, not even close. And I've been at parties where guys have, drugs and shit like that. But I made a promise in my head to myself for my son that that would never happen ever again. And I just, I'm a man of my word. Yeah, you're also one of the most dedicated fathers that, uh, that I've met, man. I see you with your kids at the fights. I see you on social media. Yeah. And uh, I believe when you say that, that they're your oxygen, um, for sure, man, it's so clear. So Steve, man, look, we, I don't want to end on a, on a negative note about that loss. D throw me one um great memory it doesn't have to be the best memory from your career throw me a just something that you like to sit there you have your your trophy case you have your photos what are some of the things you like to sit and reflect on as like i can't believe i i was there or i you know that i experienced that like that must happen every once in a while to you right um yeah absolutely especially like when i walk by these things every day i always get memories <clears throat> or there's you know a new Facebook Xboxers and people are tagging pictures of me versus Michael Hunter and stuff like that. And obviously that my first world title in enemy territory against the undefeated hometown boy to knock him out for my first world title. Greatest thing that ever happened to me. Also to have the first and then my next fight at Casino Rama to be the first fight world title fight over 20 years in Ontario, whatever it was. And to knock it end off in the round that I predicted, the ninth round, that was also an astonishing. I remember I sit in the casino after, all fucked up. I remember sitting in the casino just watching people, but it was just so busy and everyone was just so happy. And people had posters and shit like that. I just remember like, holy fuck, like these guys watched me fight and like this place is packed. Amazing, man. Amazing. 
Well, Steve, I mean, obviously we have stories that we could go on for days. We've already done 40 yeah. minutes here. So let's, uh, let's keep the, the rest of them uh, for the next time. I wanted to talk again about training out in Mexico and all these kinds of good stories. The stuff that you and I go back and forth when we're calling fights for four hours straight. You go to, hey, Ryan, you go, to, you go to Mexico to train with Eric Morales, who is at the top of his game. <laughs> Oh, Mexico, fuck, they're going to pay me? They're going to spar him, no problem. Mexico, nice and warm, 12,000 feet above sea level in uh, Toluca, Mexico. I had one track suit, and I slept in that of my running shoes every night, trembling, just shaking. It was so cold there. But then the last two weeks in Tijuana, it was Boom. hot. <laughs> Steve, man, you know what's what's funny? I was when I do the fighter interviews of all the Mexican opponents that come in be, before the United fights. I usually laugh at them because they're the ones telling that story. They show up in Canada and they got just their tracksuit, and I'm like, dude, what were you thinking? So same for you, man. But you know what? I've been in that kind of experience. My my wife's uh, mom is from Mexico City, and same thing. I was like, wow, we're going to Mexico. First time going there, like. <laughs> shorts t-shirts something nah, it's not 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 quite so there's my I, long johns buddy i feel you i feel you steve man um it's amazing to to be able to catch up a bit i missed being able to hang out uh, regularly when we call the fights so this was perfect timing just a, a couple of days after um what we were supposed to be hanging out anyways obviously you're going to come back on the show and talk some more but uh in the meantime thanks for joining us man for sharing some of those stories steve and uh i'm really happy to see every time whenever we talk that you're still in the game you're still around fighters inspiring fighters i know there's there's a documentary coming out about you all sorts of cool stuff so uh amazing man and and just great to see how uh happy you are to be honest and, and uh this transition that you were able to make from the ultimate highs in fighting to now uh transitioning into normal life and, and a successful family man it's great to see man jason thank you ryan thank you i miss you guys the first fight at um, United Promotions in Brampton, the CAA Center. We'll be there. We'll kill it as always. Yes. I love you guys. Um, great. Was it great fight, North? It is. Yep. Thank you, fellas. Have a good night. All right, brother. Take care, man. All right, we are here with our good friend. He is ranked number four in the WBA, number five in the WBO and the IBF. That's right, Vicious Patrice Volney is back with us on the Great Fight North Boxing Podcast. Patrice, thanks for coming back on, man. It's all my pleasure. I really appreciate the invitation. Well, I, uh, because we, we can't be in person like we have the last few times, I brought a stand-in for you over here. And I'm just going to leave that. I'm going to talk to this because you're always <laughs> smiling, bro. You're always, you're, you're the happiest boxer I've ever seen. So I'm going to leave that guy there and pretend that I'm talking to you in person. But uh, let's actually start with that. We're in a crazy time. We're in quarantine. Yeah. You're stuck by yourself. And yet you remain smiling. You remain training. You remain motivating people. Talk to us a little bit about what this time period has been like for you and how you've been dealing with it in terms of staying motivated to train. Um, you know, I, I think uh, that quarantine is pretty hard for everybody. Uh, we can't do nothing. So, boxer, every uh, people working in sport, business, have a rough time, gym, have a rough time. But uh, it's okay, you know. Uh, I got uh, a few things I need to work on for my next fight of when everything is back to normal. So, I do take this time. And uh, with the quarantine, you have no... There's, there's no high. You cannot escape from that. You have to work what you're supposed to work and uh, fix what you need to fix because it's a, like I can say, uh, off moment. Right. So you have time to work for it. You really have time. So that's what I do. So I say I'm 100% motivated and uh, I got objectives. So some fight I want, sometimes I really want, some a lot of things that I really want to ha make happen. So we work for it and uh, that keep me Motivate 100%. So let's talk about December. Uh, we all know what happened. You know, you flew to the U.S., to Phoenix, and then it ended <laughs> up no fight. So how, how disappointing, you know, was that to happen, especially because it was such uh -oh. a big fight? It was a big fight. And, you know, it was a, like a, it was a short notice. Short notice fight. Um, yeah. 
So I remember talking to you about that fight and everything, you know. So we went to Arizona. Uh, we have like probably like two weeks to train. I was ready. Uh, they said, stay at the gym. We will have a call one day. So be, make sure you stay ready. So I was ready. So went there. And uh, I think two days before the fight, uh, they said to my coach, when I, go, I went to the lobby, I see my coach, uh, everybody's sitting downstairs and nobody's saying nothing. I was like, I like what is what happening, you know? And uh, I said something wrong. I, th- I tell my coach, Eric, I have no fight. He said, no fight for you. The guy didn't have his visa. So we were wishing for like some magic to happen so we can't have a fight this day. But um, two days after or next day after, back to Montreal. Ah, oh, man. Was that uh, smile on your face still or did, did it actually, like, I mean, that must have made you disappointed. That, that has to be crushing. Like, not just yeah. from, a, from a psychological standpoint, but the physical buildup that you're ready to fight and then you can't. Yes. Hmm. You know, you're working hard and now, uh, you know, in the so short notice, uh, you have to put everything in training. You have to put everything in training. Um, I have two weeks to get ready. So we jump straight up um, to training camp, push to the maximum, uh, lose a lot of money because I got a lot of treatment to do. Right. And um, you go there. And it's not, it's worse because I was in Arizona when they tell me you have no fight. Yeah. If it was like, I didn't take no plane and everything, it would be okay. But um, I was already there. So that was a little bit disappointing. There was no smile that day. <laughs> there was yeah, no smile. yeah, 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 yeah. I can only imagine, man. I mean, like we talked about all the, I, I don't think that a lot of people realize the investment that a fighter makes into a fight. It's not just about yeah. the time. There's actually money laid out. There's, there's there is money. you have to pay and uh, uh, training and nutrition and food and all of that that goes into it. Um, now, not to dwell on the past, but you know, you go from one disappointing situation, okay, yeah. no problem. All of a sudden, it looks like things are turned around. You had a fight lined up for the undercard of the Kovalev versus Barrera card, I yeah. believe, on DAZN as well. So you were supposed to be on DAZN in December, then comes April 25th, something around there, you have a fight yeah, exactly. lined up. Yeah, so you must have been excited about that. How much notice did you have about that fight until you found out that, of course, everything was canceled uh, around the world at that point? I did, I did, I did, uh, they did give me like um, a reasonable time, like a, a normal time for to get ready for that fight, you know? Uh, it was, um, I think it's a Russian guy. I cannot say his name, I forgot his name. But, uh, <laughs> me too. Was I'm wondering, it was, a main, it was a main events guy, right? Scalia, yeah. do you remember who it was supposed yeah. to be? Okay. Magovan Medea. There we go. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's why yeah. we have the expert. That's why we have the expert on here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we got uh, Madiev and um, Madiev was the guy in Arizona. Ah, we, okay. Who was the guy? One. Who was the guy on the Pereira undercard? I, I, I don't know. Okay, His that name, was a different I don't guy. Know. Okay. But this guy, uh, we're supposed. Um, to fight we have like i think um a few months to get ready you know and uh, i was always in the gym so I, w- I was ready for the fight and you know it's a good guy a good uh, opening so we work for it and everything but um boom magic happened again corona so <laughs> no more fight <laughs> ah man the world conspiring the road, the road. <laughs> yeah conspiring against patrice to not be able to fight yep. man it's that uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, you found yourself in the same boat as so many other fighters, of course, in, yes. in that situation. But, you know, one of the positives, in my opinion, is that at the very least, there is that interest, uh, that, that interest in Patrice Volney to be on TV. There's obviously, yes. it's, it's obviously coming no matter what. Okay. And that's kind of what leads me into our next question. And this is the, the hot topic around, especially around Quebec boxing, but Canadian boxing. The last yeah. couple of weeks, there's been some chatter. There's been some back and forth. You got all sorts of video replies out of this guy, all sorts of stuff. You and Stephen Bang Bang Butler chirping away at each other about potential fights. Yes. Yeah. Uh, talk to us about how this, how this kind of started. You know what, even let's take it a step back. How long have you known Butler for? Have you ever 
trained with him or, or, or sparred with him? I know him, him uh, from uh, amateur boxing. I know, I, I know the guy. Uh, he's a cool guy. I respect him a lot and everything. I, I see him amateur, like, but we were not in the same division, but I knew, I, I know him. I know him from, uh, his boxing not too far from my gym and everything. So I'm cool with the guy. I'm cool with him. Okay. Okay. So um, talk to us about how all this started. Who, who sent a message <laughs> to who first? You know, I saw that um, people, they are challenging uh, other boxers. I heard him challenge uh, Francis Lafreniere, who from Montreal too, you know, yep. uh, a metal weight too. So, but the fact that I'm, that I'm fighting in Ontario, they don't put that much intention, you know, Mm. But I'm still there. I'm still middleweight. And I'm still in Canada, in Montreal. So I'm able to fight. Yep. So I uh, talk with um, the news. So let them know that I'm down to fight Stephen Butler. I want to fight. I'm not scared. I'm not afraid of none. Yep. I want to fight. So after this, uh, a lot of talking, a lot of talking, um, Say this is a lot of bad thing I can say about my team. I don't respond about. I'm okay with it. Say whatever you want. It's in the ring. We fix thing in the ring. I like it. I like it. So he came back. He said. He said uh, send a contract, etc. Do you know if that's happening or or like what's the next step? Here? <laughs> what's what does it take to get this fight to happen? Uh, next step. It's uh. We'll see. We'll see. So my team. We're talking. We're talking. So they know, but they do know I want to fight. Okay. My team know 100% that I want to fight. So they will do their best to make it happen. If his team want to fight too, because they say send, send the contract. Right. So I'm, I wish when the contract send, they say yes. Okay. So how do you think the fight would go? Um, you've sparred with Butler before, right? Yeah. We sparred we spar before, we sparred once before. Okay, only one time, okay. Only one time. Okay, and is this a what happens in sparring stays in sparring kind of moment? Uh, do you, yeah. Do you have that, comment? <laughs> that, that's my rule. I, I, I keep it, uh, okay. what happens fair. in sparring stays in sparring. Yeah. Totally fair, man. Totally fair. So how do, you, how do you foresee a fight with Butler going, though? I mean, talking about both of your guys' strengths and weaknesses, what do you see in Butler that you think – uh, would give uh, a challenge and of course you don't want to go into too much detail and give away secrets but how do you see a fight like that going it's a it's a good fight you know it's a good boxer he's a good boxer he has a lot of power um good boxer good technique but i got uh good boxing skill i got a crazy reach and i got something uh a little extra people don't really know Okay, this is intriguing now. I, I like the sound of this, man. This reminds me of back when Manny Pacquiao was first coming onto the scene and they talked about Manila really? Ice, the secret, <laughs> the secret weapon, right? So now I, I really want to exactly. see that. Okay, there is another guy that we want to kind of ask you about. And I just want to just want to kind of build it up a little bit here. Take it back, 2017, Bell Center, one of the biggest uh, Canadian versus Canadian matchups of two undefeated prospects at the time that I can remember. I was there ringside. The place went crazy afterwards from the result. And that was Brandon Bad Boy Cook stopping Stephen Butler in what was viewed as an upset yeah. at the time. Have you ever thought about the idea of maybe, in, you know, right now we're focusing on all these Quebec fighters. What about, yeah. you know, you fight out of Ontario. What about a... Ontario versus Ontario, as it were, but still Quebec versus Ontario matchup against a guy like Bad Boy. Has that ever popped into your guys' mind before? That pops in my mind. Pops in my mind. It probably pops in my team mind, too. And uh, if uh, Brenda Cook uh, is uh, – what weight is Brenda Cook now? He's, he's talked to us when he was on the podcast last time. And, uh, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe he said that he's feeling – yeah. strong at 160 now he put on some muscle after he lost the weight from his injury um and he seemed intent on kind of going that 160 route at the time ryan was he was that right yeah i love the smile when you heard that <laughs> 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 so 
if yeah, uh, so. if it's in one sixty, if uh you move up to one sixty, um, I'm down to dance with him. All right. If he, if he feels to, I want to. If the team, my team, his team, able to manage everything and put everything in a good way, I fight the kid. That would be awesome. I fight the kid. He got a lot of experience. I think he has a uh, more fights than me. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I challenge. I challenge. If you send me a challenge, God bless, I take it. Beautiful. I take it. What happened happened in the ring, but I'm training for to make sure that what I want to happen happened. Love it. So talking about, um, you know, Butler, and he seems to get all the, the media coverage, you know, and you're ranked like, you know, top five in basically three sanctioning bodies. So why do you think you don't get a lot of attention from the media in Quebec. Okay, yeah. So I, I think I don't have that um, media coverage because uh, of the fact that I'm training in uh, Ontario, and that I'm fighting in Ontario actually, and uh, people don't really give you that attention because you're not especially in Montreal. So speaking of training in Ontario, um, right now, obviously, you've been, I guess, stuck in Montreal. Uh, you're, not, yeah. you're not coming to Ottawa to do your training. We talked about it last time on the podcast, but now we're on video podcast, so we might as well cover it a little bit again. So your trainer, Eric Belanger, good friend of ours as well. Yeah. Uh, he's located where I am out here in Ottawa. Uh, yeah. Are you still planning on, once all of this is over, are you still planning on doing commute training like between Montreal and Ottawa? Are you going to stay living in Montreal? Have you ever thought about moving? Moving to Ontario, that kind of thing. I still, I still, uh, I still want to live in uh, Montreal. That's I love Montreal. I, I, too, I really man. love Montreal. I don't you know? blame you. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I still, uh, I still want to uh, like go to Ottawa and uh, back to Montreal. Ottawa, go to Toronto. I love like the fact that you change area a little bit, so it's different. You're not, you're more focused when you're in a different place. I can say you have no distraction around so it's easier for a training camp and uh, everything but I do have another coach in Montreal I do have a second coach okay okay good 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 so you're able to stay sharp while you're there too yeah 100% yeah so we all work together uh, my second coach my first coach and uh, condition coach they all work together so they make sure I'm uh, ready for the every day every fight that we have yeah, so obviously in December, like, you had a very short notice fight, but right now, obviously, like, you can't even do sparring, right? So how, how long would it take you to train for a fight right now? Um, right now, I think, give me a month. Okay. Give me a month. Okay. Give me a month. If they want to mix in the ring in July, uh, I don't know. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Yes. I'm ready. I've been ready for a long time. I'm just waiting for the moment. Amazing, man. Okay, this sounds fantastic. Um, I mean, I think no matter what, we're going to be seeing Patrice Volney back in the ring early. You've put your name out yeah. there. You're, you're fit. You're ready. Four weeks is nothing, man. That's perfect. And I'm, you know, both of us and everybody across the country, all boxing fans are keeping our fingers crossed that we can get some of these closed door fights um, in July. My last question for you is actually about that experience and how you think that was going to go. Did you watch, by the way, any of the UFC from from the last week? Yeah, it was a, uh, it was strange, you know. Yeah, it, it uh, is a little bit odd, right? Yeah, it's um, you know, it's like going to a sparring session with no noise, nobody yeah. screaming, yeah, nothing. Even watching on TV, it's pretty special. It's like, and I don't know how they get ready. What do you how mean? How can you get ready? How can um, you for get... a fight with nobody inside that your arena. Because mm. when I watched the UFC, there was nobody. So the motivation, um, you know, the, the emergency, emergency feeling, yeah. you cannot have it because there's no crowd. You need that second boost. You need that noise. Interesting. So you're talking about, like, getting that adrenaline, that adrenaline rush from the experience that yeah, may not be there now. Ah, that's exactly. interesting. Okay. That's a very interesting point. Do you think that that will have an effect on you. Do you think that for some fighters, there's a chance that they kind of revert to a sparring mentality as opposed to big fight mentality? Do you think that's, that's possible? I think, I think uh, in my case, I don't think that's going to uh, affect me because um, 
no matter what, I just want to, um, I got like that, uh, I got rage, I got rage. So I want to, I want to use that in the ring, first round to the last round. I don't really care, you know. I take chances, but uh, a few bucks ago, like, they need that yeah. second boost. You need the crowd to lift yeah. you up sometimes when, uh, not necessarily when it's going bad, but, uh, you know, when you kind of losing energy and mm. you, need, you need that boost. So I think it's going to affect a lot of them. It did it affect a lot of the uh, guy from the UFC? Probably. I think so. Yeah. I, th I think that's uh, that's true as well. It's going to be an adjustment period for everybody, for you guys in the ring, obviously, most importantly, for us as fans as well, yep. um, people working in it. Uh, it's, it's all going to be different. But the main thing is it looks like we're getting closer and closer, my friend, to seeing you back in there. Um, yeah. Patrice, thank you, brother, for coming back on once again. Um, it's always fun to talk to you. When you mentioned that you have rage, all I still picture is just this. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, I know once you're in there, that vicious moniker that you have does come back out. So can't wait to see it again. Um, Patrice, man, good luck as you and your team kind of navigate what the next fight is. Keep yep. training hard. Keep motivating others with your social media because I think you're doing an amazing job. I love it. Thank you. And uh, we will talk again soon, man. Hopefully, I'll see you at the gym here at final round at some point in the next couple That's months. That's for too. sure. Once, once all this is done, we pass all this situation, uh, I'm still training. Maybe, maybe not at the gym, but uh, we're going to bring something new. Something awesome, new. Man. Amazing. Okay, Patrice, thanks again, man. Thanks to you. I right, appreciate thanks, it. Man. All right, man. Huge thank you to both Steve, the Canadian Kid Molitor, and Patrice Vicious Volney. Um, so much fun to talk to both those guys. So much personality. Uh, it, 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 lots of smiles. It, it was a lot of fun, man. Really, really great talking to them. Um, Scalia, we had uh, a couple things coming out over this last week that lead us closer and closer once again to boxing being back. Um, I know uh, we saw some stories come out, media stories about Eye of the Tiger and Camille Estefan saying that they hired some lobbyists to work with the Quebec government um, and basically lay out a plan for them to bring boxing back. I think that's pretty wise, man. I mean, if you can afford to do something like that, um, if you want the government to move at anything other than a snail's pace, you kind of got to do it yourself. Yeah, and it should be interesting to see how that works. I mean, it's the right thing to do. Um, we just saw news about Eddie Hearn is going to hold fights in his backyard. So he kind of took Camille's idea. Yeah. You no, know, I, I wonder who has the bigger backyard. That's, that's, but, uh, a, that's a really good question. <laughs> We'd have to compare. And I know obviously Eddie listens and watches every single one of our episodes start to finish. So I know that he jacked Camille's idea. Hopefully he gives him credit for it. Yeah. But either way, just looking forward to fights coming back to Canada. We're still, a few months away at least, but uh, stuff is brewing. Yeah, speaking of brewing, we also, you know, there, there's been talk about, um, of course, any kind of medium to high level Canadian fighter is getting called out by other Canadian fighters right now. We talked about it with Patrice Volney and, and Stephen Butler. Um, there was talk about Sadradin with him. There's all sorts of stuff. Uh, Zuski is another name that's been floated around before. I mean, all of us would love to see Zuski take on a guy like Castillo Clayton or something like that, obviously. But Scalia, you texted me the other day saying that uh, Zuski mentioned he's fighting early July. What do you think that could mean? Well, again, I'm not sure exactly, but that's what he seemed to hint at. So hmm. I don't know that and it'd have to be in Canada, obviously. So I'm not really sure uh, what to make of it. You know, it's kind of out of left field. I mean, it's possible that it could be a big top rank card in the U.S. that they're talking about. You know, maybe by then in July, uh, travel restrictions would have been eased. It looks like the U.S. is trying to open up quite a bit right now so who knows i mean uh i'm sure yvonne is looking to make a play with top rank who seems to be first in getting back in june at least in the u.s uh, is that correct yeah top rank's probably going to be back in june next month running two to three shows every week so okay. obviously reduce shows with like four fights per card but still so if they if they can get in there, I mean, uh, obviously there's opportunities for guys like uh, potentially Rivas. Uh, did Rivas end up signing with uh, with Eddie or anybody? Is he still a free agent? 
I think he's, I can't remember now. There was chatter about it, right? He yeah. went down to talk to people. Um, but either way, obviously Alvarez um, and of, of course Zuski can potentially be on those cards too. So I'm sure we'll see some kind of allegiance between Yvonne and top rank sooner than later in the U.S. if they could get down there. Um, aside from that, man, not much huge in the world of news of Canadian boxing. But like I said, just, just for interest sake, because I want to get your take on it and we're here. Um, UFC, MMA, the, uh, the idea and the difference of going out on your shield and taking a beating. I think the more and more that we see these like full all stand up fights, the more we're going to see those kinds of, of, uh, of beat downs. But there were many moments in uh, that Gaethje fight last Saturday um, and a few moments in the, in the, uh, in the main this past Wednesday, I guess it was too, where it's clear that these guys have no chance, um, especially, maybe I'm wrong, Ryan, but especially in MMA where the, the amount of energy it takes to do some of those moves, like we saw that roll at the end of, of, of that fight on Saturday. And when these guys are moving at a snail's pace because they have broken orbital bones and they're completely beaten down, why is it that, in your opinion, that there, there seems to be no talk ever of the corner stopping the fight like there is in box like we see it all the time in boxing the coaches are always i'm going to stop this fight if you don't throw some and the ref if you don't throw a punch back i'm going to stop the fight what's the deal like is this just not a common thing in mma no one really it's very rare to see corner stoppages in mma you'll never see anyone throw a towel in mma i mean mma has only been around like you know 27 years compared to uh, well over a hundred for boxing. So, I mean, but do you think then that it's just a machismo thing where it's like, this is the tough guy sport. That's kind of how it first started. The idea of quitting wouldn't be acceptable. I mean, when you were watching those fights, were there times where you thought, man, honestly, they should stop it. After round four of the Smith fight, you know, even during the round should have been stopped, but you know, I think a lot of it is connected to uh, money as well mm. because of, you know, the purses are divided into show money, win money. And uh, obviously, I think that coaches could be thinking about that because they're getting a percentage, you know, and the money they're making is less than boxing because we all know uh, MMA fighters get paid a lot less than boxing. Yeah. So I think that's part of it. But I also just think it's kind of uh, a mentality type yeah. of thing it's it's kind of weird like someone t- t- could take a savage beating and like you know they won't quit but they'll get put in like an arm bar and they'll tap out you know it's kind yeah. of like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. kind of a it's kind of a weird thing you know it is it is very strange um and you know you mentioned about the money and that these guys don't necessarily or may not nece- necessarily get those retirement nest eggs that some of the fighters uh, boxers will all the more reason for them not to take hellacious beatings, extended beatings um, to the head for a long period of time. So I, I do hope that that kind of does shift. I think that would be nice. Um, all right, let's move it along, Scalia. Uh, before we wrap it, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to our boy, Samir Azizi. You were on his podcast again this past week. I've been on it before. Uh, I thought that was awesome, man. That was so interesting to hear you talk to, to, to rewind a bit it's funny we don't you and I never talk about our you know whatever design philosophy or, or scouting philosophies things like that on this show this show's about Canadian boxing it's not about us it was really interesting to hear you talk about uh, what you do and it still blows my mind that you can have that much knowledge without any notes man that is just so fascinating to me so a really cool um really cool outlook from that uh if you guys are not already subscribed to azizi podcast get on that right now go on to youtube we'll put a link uh at the bottom here as well make sure you get on there subscribe um amazing guy he's now a fellow canadian located in toronto of course by way of kazakhstan and la uh but uh you got to hear if you guys want to know more about what ryan scalia actually does um and why he's so respected in the world of boxing aside from being a co-host on great fight north uh definitely go check that out so good job scalia man was it uh, did you have fun 
Yeah, definitely. I don't, I don't really talk about that stuff very often, but you know, I think we're getting to the point where it's time to make some moves, you know? Yep. So I thought I would uh, open up a little bit and uh, stay tuned. Exactly, man. I'm, I'm privy to some of the, some of the uh, things that you talked about. So um, I'm excited about it too. I know we're all excited about the return of boxing, getting back into business for you and I, business-wise, getting back into business as fans. Um, it's coming, guys. Uh, Scalia, man, let's wrap it. Episode 70 of the Great Fight North Boxing Podcast is done. More great interviews coming your way next week. We're having fun, man. Yeah, man more content than ever the video is a great aspect and uh but yeah i like it even better it just feels like you're connecting even more yeah 100 percent. i think the fans uh appreciate seeing their favorite fighters as well um and again you know we mentioned at the top of the show every single time huge thank you to carrie hendren uh carrie hendren remax all-stars realty inc um scrapyard boxing club in peterborough that's why we're able to do this kind of stuff. That's why Scali is able to upgrade his equipment. We're able to have our pro Zoom accounts and all of this stuff uh, is thanks to that. So uh, please guys, uh, my parting wish for this week, if you guys are a member of a boxing club uh, or ever have been in your area, reach out, just reach out to one of the coaches, reach out to them, um, tell them you're thinking about them and, and thanking them for basically providing uh, the, the ground and the foundation of the sport that we love. I know Scrapyard Boxing Club uh, was able to sell a whole ton of hoodies today to help pay those bills. These guys still have to pay rent. Let's get out there and try and do what we can to help them for the growth of the sport here in Canada. Thank you guys. We'll talk to all of you guys for episode 71 of the Great Fight North Boxing Podcast next week.